Turn It On, the Level 42 Fan Podcast is in no way affiliated with the band. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are solely the speaker's own. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Turn It On, the Level 42 Fan Podcast. We are here with our typical trio from here in the U.S., here to talk the time away with all things Level 42, the convivial Mikey Payne. Say hello, Mikey. Hello, everyone. The irrepressible Winston M. Walker, windman with many faces and many names. Please say hello. Hey, good morning, everybody, at least this morning here. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm Bob Considine, also saying hello to all the Level 40s fans out there, past, current, and future from all over the world. Uh, we appreciate you being here. So, gentlemen, I know this is the time we take on uh, kind of an appetizer topic for the podcast before we get into the main course discussion. Uh, but I think if you don't mind today, we're going to go right to the main course straight away as we are extremely fortunate uh, to have an incredible guest with us today. He is the man who lives on the edge with time on his side. He is the man who searches to find the reasons for the wrong and for the right. He is the man who is walking down the road trying to reach a brighter day. He is a very nice man. He's an extremely talented man. He's a West Coast man. He is Level 42 co-founder, keyboardist, vocalist, writer, and player extraordinaire, Mr. Mike Lindup. Mike, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, you're more than welcome. It's great to be here. Uh, I know Winston and Mikey echo my enthusiasm here that uh, to have you in your physical presence is really great. Thanks. Well, you know, virtual physical presence, I suppose. We'll take whatever we can get, right? Yeah. You know, Mike, as we were preparing for this sit down, I, I couldn't help but think back to your earliest days with Level 42. We're talking like March 1980. Gateway Studios in Clapham, where you're pondering your musical DNA, uh, you would put somewhere in those 16 tracks that might someday influence the world. At any point in those halcyon days, did you ever dream that you you would be on a uh, Level 42 fan podcast with three guys from the States? Um, well, first of all, I, I wouldn't have known what podcast meant. <laughs> it didn't mean anything <laughs> then. <laughs> um, True. Fan, I understood, but, um, you know, this was like uh, nobody knew who we were when we were recording, you know, Love Meeting Love at Gateway. And right. so, you know, I mean, the question when we finished it for me was, you know, will anyone else like it as much as we do? So, mm. you know, <laughs> that's what it was. That's amazing. And just so long, so many years go by, right? It's uh it just to think back those days and now we're however many years we are removed from that. Just, you know, I think you guys have made such a mark. I know Winston and Mikey feel the same. Uh, but I think we wanted to start today just talking about something more current. You know, your recent show at the Jazz Cafe, where you were able to take your latest album, Changes 2, to a very enthusiastic live audience. What did you uh, make of this experience? Um, I was extraordinary in so many ways. Um, you know, the pleasure to finally, you know, give changes to its first live outing was immense. Um, but the pressure was also immense because um, I wanted it to be, you know, a great launch of it. Um, you know, I was I was playing at a kind of prestigious London venue, the Jazz Cafe. So it had to be really good, as good as I could make it. And um, and a lot of went into the album, and so I was trying to figure out what what I needed to reproduce. You know, quite early on in discussion with my producers Mike Pato and Tony Economides, um, uh, the the idea of of obviously using the laptop as part of the band was kind of um, was a must really. Um, just after all the effort and work we put into the four years of recording it. Um, but I, I, you know, I also wanted it to be a live experience. So choosing the musicians was one job, and then 
you know, liaising with the venue, um, organizing rehearsals, organizing the, the, the sound crew, deciding which songs to do, um, you know, trying to f find, um, you know, the, the right musicians, uh, which I already mentioned. But I mean, that, that was a big part of it. And uh, and I knew that lots of people would be coming in for the show. Um, I didn't know it would be sold out, which is fantastic. I mean, it's the biggest audience I've ever had for a solo show. Wow. So there was just loads on it. And, you know, I'd driven down from Scotland with my precious Profit 5, which has kind of been in retirement really since 2010. Um, <laughs> I mean, I use it on the album and in the studio, but it's never not gone on stage very much. And, uh, you yeah, know, so there was a lot of work and, and writing out scores and, and you know, parts for the, for the guys. And so I was kind of exhausted. By the time I actually stepped onto the stage, you know, you could have knocked me over with a feather and and then getting on the stage and then, you know, feeling the kind of the response and the love that was in the room uh, just oh, was was mind blowing and really kind of energizing in a in a beautiful way. And and then the gig went and, it you know, it couldn't have gone better, really, for a first outing. I mean, I'm not saying it was a perfect gig because it wasn't, but it, it was great uh, in all the right ways. And I was. You know, I was really satisfied by the end of it. And, uh, yeah, just an amazing, amazing thing. Very cool. Um, I'm just going to say I was happy to see that Prophet 5 make an appearance because that, growing up and wanting to play keyboards, I was enamored with that instrument. And it was seeing you play it and Joe Zalino play it. And I think Zalino mm -hmm. used like a Prophet 10 as well. And that was like the keyboard that I always wanted, but never could find at a decent price where it wasn't busted up. Yeah, yeah. It it is it's it is an incredible keyboard. I mean, um, you know, it was it was the first, as I understand it, the first kind of programmable polyphonic synth. And um, it was you know Mr. Wally Badaru who introduced me to it. Um, you know, he he was familiar with it, and he was kind of really. A, a synth programmer um, supreme and, and very original programmer as well, as well as a player. And so when we were in the studio doing um, the early tapes album, which was the first album that we recorded, um, Wally had got uh, hired a profit, I think, um, for the sessions. And just watching him programming and all the sounds he could get out of it, and at the time that he would take to get the sounds as well, um, you know, because in and at that time, you know, Andy Soika was running a tight ship. And so we'd have from, I think, something like 10 in the morning until 6 p.m. at night sharp. And, uh, you know, we'd always finish at 6 p.m. no matter where we were, even if we were in the middle of something, uh, you know. And Andy would be shouting things like, OK, we've got 10 more minutes for this idea. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, you know, Wally is not a 10 more minutes bloke you know he'd be honing the sound and i just need a bit of eq on the desk and can you find this effect and blah 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 and uh you know we're kind of looking at our watches thinking you know well this better be worth it wally and of course it always was um but uh yeah that and then the, the joy of, of the profit five was that when we started playing live and um I, we got our first advance from polydor i was able to find one um, a second-hand one, I think it was. Um, but it meant that we, you could record all the programs from one synth onto a cassette, yeah. and uh, it would sort of digitally, in a way, even though it's an analog synth, it would record this sort of thing that sounded like a fax machine. And then yes. you plug the cassette into another Profit 5, and it would sort of hoover up the programs. So I could actually take the programs that we used in the studio onto stage, and I could instantly jump between programs because of the way that the buttons are laid out, which was just brilliant. And so that was such a great kind of axe to have and uh, and use to reproduce the, the albums live in the early days. Awesome. That is awesome. Incredible. Um, Mike, uh, I'm going to get to the Jazz Cafe uh, again in a minute, but you're talking about the tech stuff. I'm going to get the tech stuff out of the way. Um, in a live music perspective you know piano organ string patches are are never really a problem however um brass and horn sounds can be sometimes difficult to reproduce and 
when you were bringing your changes to stuff for the Jazz Cafe gig, did you have any problems with patches or how, how do you, when you translate something live, uh, how, how do you get those brass horn sounds that are really difficult to reproduce? Well, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, on a lot of the level 42 stuff, especially in the early days, we kind of favored synth brass and because um, we didn't actually want real brass. We actually wanted to create synth brass sounds because it was, it was kind of more interesting for us. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to changes too, um, you know, it was very kind of keyboard uh, prominent, I would say. But there were like, you know, a couple of tracks that I really wanted to have brass on. And, and you know, it wanted to be real brass. And okay. by then I developed a great relationship with um, Nicole Thompson, um, who yeah. plays oh, yes. trombone live with us and is a fantastic composer and arranger in his own right. Interesting. And, uh, and, and Nicole works regularly with this other trumpet player called Tom Walsh. And I sent the, the tracks over to, to them and they came up, um, well, with um, Atlantia, they came up with all of the brass parts for that, um, which was just fantastic. And before that, they'd done You Can't Just Live As, as An Island, which mm-hmm. they'd composed, you know, the, the, the brass arrangements for most of it. And I had a couple of lines in at the beginning and, and also at the end, which I'd sort of done on a kind of fake brass patch, but with the idea of it being sort of realized for real. And uh, so when it came to when it came to doing it live, um, I thought, well, I'm going to use I'm go, I'm go, I've got the computer. I'm going to actually use the light, the, the tracks that they recorded and have those come out live because it will just it will sound great. And uh, I think nowadays, you know, people are kind of used to, you know, not craning their necks and thinking, well, I can hear brass or I can hear backing vocals. How come I can't see one? Because, that, you know, they know that people, you know, have stuff on track. So that was fine. And in fact, I did ask Nickel and Tom if they wanted to, to come and sort of, you know, play live along with their brass. But uh, unfortunately, that they, they, they weren't able to make it for the show. So, mm. uh, <laughs> boy, I don't know how you fit another guy up there. It was a <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it kind of turned it turned out all right, yes, because that stage is quite narrow. You know, Mike, one of the things I want to ask you about this show in particular, and, and really as a live performer love, with Love 42, uh, you know, in many ways, you're kind of a technician up there playing multiple parts, singing. I was wondering if you're ever able to emotionally take in how an audience is responding to, you know, while you're doing so many parts is is there is your brain able to do both <laughs> it's just what i'm getting to um to some extent i would say i mean you know i i can always just with the experience of having done it for you know 43 years and counting um right. i can sort of feel the room to some extent you know you can feel if people are with you you know, whether they're engaged or whether they're not, whether they're distracted. I mean, yes, of course, there'll always be, you know, a few people at the back you know, having a conversation about something else and so on. I mean, that's normal. But um, I have di- I've discovered that kind of being honest is a good thing on stage. And mm. I always admire it when I watch other artists where they will... Um, just be themselves and be in the moment and and not sort of try and sort of cover up if something goes wrong necessarily right um and uh and and you react to something that happens in the room at the time and maybe decide to do something else as a result and i was thought that was very admirable so and i was feeling in a pretty vulnerable place as i said when i stepped onto the stage <laughs> so i thought well this is the first time it's going to go how it's going to go and i'm just going to be with it and uh and you know hopefully everyone will go along for the ride now having said that you know i i, I really felt the the kind of the, the appreciation in the room and and i could watch people's reactions even though i was kind of busy on stage you know when i would start off a number i could sort of quickly check out the room and see who was responding and you know just it just needs a few people to just sort of raise their hands or say you know punch the air and you think yeah well i know that there's going to be certain people that will really love this yeah and uh, and then of course afterwards luckily because i had so many friends and family there i got feedback 
about you know how it felt to be in the audience when I went into certain things and what what the reaction was and so on. So I kind of got the bigger picture after the fact. Well, it sure translated. Uh, our buddy Julian Hall took some awesome video there at the Jazz Cafe. I, I think he was sitting on your drummer's lap. He was that close. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you could just feel the you could feel the love and the energy. Um, from both you, Mike, and from the fans that were there, uh, mm. just from those videos. Um, I'm interested to know, uh, is there going to be a release of, of the Jazz Cafe gig? No, there isn't. Um, and that's kind of deliberate because I did consider, because there were a few requests from, you know, people such as yourselves who, you know, wouldn't be able to get to the show. You know, would I be recording it? Would I be filming it? And I did think about filming it or recording it or live streaming it. But in the end, um, you know, it was going to be another thing to do. Um, mm. And, you know, there were, there was, I wouldn't say complications, but there were procedures involved in getting permission to, to film or to record. There might have been a commission involved. And then, you know, you don't exactly know what you're going to get. It was the first time I was playing those numbers. It was the first time, you know, uh, you know, Joey, M Mark Jowett, who um, regularly does monitors on stage. He also does out front sound for other artists. And uh, I asked him to do out front sound for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew he'd do a good job. But at the same time, it's the first time he's done the gig. And I thought, right. you know what? I don't actually want to record this. Right. I gotcha. want it to be the people who are there are going to get the full experience. The people who weren't there, they'll get flavors of it because people will be, you know, filming it you yep. know, with their phones and so on. And and that's fine. And I thought, you know, if I want to record the gig, I'd rather record it, you know, 10 or 11 shows down the line when we all know what we're doing. And I can sort of focus on making sure that that's done properly, because I was I didn't even know, you know, if I could keep all the plates that I had up and spinning you know just performing the song so it was another pressure that i just didn't want on top of me <laughs> well it surely didn't show it 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 sounded and looked brilliant and 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 as a fan of of you and level 42 we could really see you having fun and that made it even more enjoyable i think for me watching it well it it, it was fun i mean part of the, the i mean the, the band were just great and I was so fantastic it. yes you know it, it, i mean it made my job so much easier to know that they'd really taken care of stuff i mean you know with my help and you know a couple of rehearsals and a, a lot a lot of a sound check rehearsal as well but you know once we kind of got into the grooves it's like you know, Yolanda and, and John Sam, the drummer, they were just really laying it down. And, and it was just then a pleasure to to be able to sing and play. And um, of course, you know, part of my brain was just, you know, trying to remember the lyrics and, you know, how long does this, does this ending go on for and what <laughs> do we have and so on. I mean, there's about a million things going on all at the same time. And, uh, um, you know, fortunately, um, like I say, having had, 43 years of experience i knew enough that i could at certain times just say well i'm gonna relax and enjoy it as well as be concentrating and working because you know this is the first time and i want to make the most of it and i want to be here for it and uh, um you know you know and so th there were times when I could really just you know relax into the flow and other times where it was kind of like Okay, I'm working on stage, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm working to make it sound relaxed. You know, it's the whole kind of swan analogy. The swan just looks effortless and its feet are busy under the surface paddling furiously. You know, in listening to Julian's video, and as Mikey said, he really was on the drummer's lap. I'm sorry, who is the drummer, Mikey? Am I uh, yeah, okay, so he was a new guy to me. So, um, uh, when I asked Yolanda to do the show, you know, she was my first choice and yep. she's, you know, obviously because we have past history and she's great she is um, when I played with her live and also she's on loads of tracks on the album. So it was a natural fit. And I said to her, you know, who's a good drummer that you've worked with recently? Um, and because I, I kind of wanted someone of the kind of the new younger generation. And uh, um, so I, and she said, well, there's this guy. John Sam, I did, um, you know, she did a, like a function gig, I think, with him. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a bit of a jam and she said he's really solid. 
And Yolanda saying somebody's really solid means they are ultra, you know, that way, because, you know, I know that she's quite fussy about who she plays with. Right. And, um, and he just worked out a treat. Um, I believe his brother, Joe, Sam, is a, a really great bass player. And I think he plays with Pete Ray Biggin sometimes and oh, okay. maybe Incognito and so on. And uh, um, so John, I didn't know. And the first time I met him was in rehearsals. I mean, I obviously spoke to him on the phone beforehand, you know, prepping him. And, uh, you know, when we got to the first rehearsals and you know, did the first couple of numbers, I thought, definitely. And, uh, and it was a delight to play with him. I thought... Those guys as a rhythm section were fantastic. I really was surprised at how good they were. And, you know, maybe this drummer, he, he might not have been familiar, but I felt like he was interpreting your songs correctly, like on the first gig, which I was like, wow. And he, he was a little reminiscent of Garen, Gavin Harrison to me a little bit too. Mm -hmm. he plays. Yeah, um, I, I, I was I, I was just really really happy because um, uh, you know on the album uh, a lot of the drums are kind of hybrid. You know they're they're kind of yeah. me playing top kit, you know hi hat and or maybe hi hat and snare and sometimes hi hat snare and toms, and then you know sometimes the snare and and, and bass drum are programs. Often the bass drum was programmed. Um, so it was this, this, and that was a kind of an intentional thing from the producers. They really wanted to sort of, you know, bring me, not necessarily up to date, but just to take me in a production way that was, you know, not the kind of live playing thing and not the completely, you know, programmed sort of drum machine thing, but, you know, somewhere in between. Right. And I mean, I'm, I must admit, I really enjoyed dusting off my kind of rusty drum chops and, uh, <laughs> And, and, and playing and recording and, and with the help of the technology, I will say, because, you know, I, I can play pretty much, my timing's pretty good, but it's not absolutely, you know, gig recording session solid because I've not played drums for years and years. Right. So fortunately with Logic um, uh, and Tony Economides' expertise, you know, what he could do is is we could listen to the tape, the drum tape that I'd done and you could take it like, uh, you know, a few bars and then put something called a, a, like a rhythm template over that. Yep. Yep. And what that would do is, is the computer um, in, you know, the, the, the software within Logic would take those four bars that I played and then he'd apply that across the whole of the track. So it would bring it into, it would kind of bring it better in time, but not, lock it to a kind of mechanical grid it would yeah. still have some of the kind of feeling of of my swing in there yep. and it was just this lovely thing where you know it could make me sound better but not make me sound like a robot sort of thing and uh and uh it, and so that was what kind of john i think he really picked up the baton really well and i think you're right i think he was really he was drumming and he was really aware of the songs and the arrangement of the songs you know he wasn't drumming you know, like some drummers do to make, to kind of sound good as a drummer and to get right. fantastic drum sounds. It was about mm -hmm. serving the song. I could really yep. feel that without even having to explain that to him. That's yeah. awesome. It is awesome. And you, when you're talking about like being mechanical, I'm thinking back, um, back in like 1991, I was reading a story with you, Mike, uh, in Keyboard Magazine. And you were talking about how Level 42 does quantize but it's your goal never to sound like craft work. Like it's not too mechanical. And I think you guys have always done that really well over the years. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think I was probably talking about, you know, playing with a seat on and, you know, we, you know, a lot of the times, you know, right. we, uh, and for many years we've been playing certain songs with, with tracks. So we're playing to a click, but the idea is not to make it sound like we're all kind of, stuck in a you know some kind of a neck lock of a, of having to be with the click it's it's it always seems to feel and and sound like the computer is another musician on stage and we're all playing together you know rather than we're slaves to the computer and that's that's the ideal i think very cool yeah my my takeaway i'm i'm i understand your reasoning for not recording the gig being the first one everything you explained um 
it was great just seeing clips from all the fans that were there. Like for me, when you walked on stage and that response from the audience just kind of warmed my heart to see in the clips tons of people that I know singing along. Hmm. That was great. And then, of course, like currently my favorite track on the album is Could It Really Be with Tony Mumrell, who I love. And to see that he showed up and that live performance was just killer. Just killer. Congrats. Thanks. Well, you know, congrats to Tony. He was just fantastic. Um, I mean, I knew he'd be great. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I mean, he's got that experience of being able to just go on stage and just, you know, grab a crowd by the scruff of the neck and, uh, yeah. and, um, and then it was just a pleasure because, you know, he kind of slightly goes, you know, sometimes off, I mean, he doesn't go off. I mean, he kind of improvises, so he doesn't necessarily sing exactly like he sang on the record, which is great, which is what you want. Yes, yes. Um, but then also the pleasure for me, which, you know, I don't get to do that often, is the fact that it's kind of a duet in, uh, in a, lot of pl a lot of ways. And so, oh. you know, he kind of gave me per permission to go off piste as well, as it were. And, uh, and so that was really fun to do and, and something that, uh, you know, in a kind of, you know, a soul jazz way, um, just because of where he's coming from. It sort of leaned me into that direction vocally, which was, which was lovely. And I thought I'd really like to do this some more. Yeah. I look forward to, you know, if you have some more gigs lined up or if you, you know, you set something up in the future, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, the thing is that uh, some of the, you know, all the musicians that I've worked, I work with on the show, I mean, you know, they're all working musicians. I mean, Tony's doing his own thing and he's working with Incog and so on. So I don't know how many opportunities in the future. I won't always be able to have him on stage necessarily, but uh, right. I'll be working towards that when I can. It would be great to have you in the U.S. Uh, for a show. And if in that case, we can get Ursula Recker there because she's here based in the States. Yeah, that would that would be great. I did actually message Ursula to tell her that I was doing the show and that I would be doing, you know, our song, as it were. And cool. uh, um, I, I kind of wanted her to know. And, you know, I, I asked her if she if she felt, you know, she could sort of send a message, um, uh, you know, but uh, she didn't choose to do that, which was fine. Um, and um, but she did say. You know, it's great that, that, that the song is coming out and the message is coming out. And, and it would be great to do that with her because I'm sure that she would take it to another level as well, you know, doing that song live. Um, so that would be great to do at some point. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mike, was it when you finally got to go to the Jazz Cafe and, and you're getting ready to come out on stage, mm. um, and you're about to this changes to that you sat on for four years and you're about to play it live for the first time. Were you, were you surprised by how some of the songs that you'd written in the studio and recorded, how they transitioned in a live environment? Did, did one song kind of take on a new meaning or uh, did you feel differently about a song than you did in the studio? Well, um, I mean, it's a sort of coming together of, of things. Um, and, you know, because when when I was recording, um, as is quite often, you know, you're, you're building a track up over a series of weeks and sometimes months, you know, because what happened, I started recording Changes 2 in March of 2019. And I was doing like two days on average every three weeks with Tony and Mike because they're really busy with other artists that they produce. So it was unusual in that I wasn't going in and having a block of time to do the album with Tony wow. and Mike. And it was kind of like two days here and then a break and then two days there and then three weeks off and two days there and then four weeks off and two days there. So it was kind of started like that. And then what happened was the pandemic happened and mm -hmm. I moved up to Scotland and mm. so that that sometimes the gaps got longer because you know we weren't allowed to you know 
be in a room together and et cetera, et cetera. And all of the kind of psychological and, you know, mental uh, effects of, of, of dealing with suddenly being locked down and this whole new situation of a world pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time, uh, and I, and I, I had focused a lot on the lyrics, you know, this, this was a real opportunity for me to kind of step up to the plate as a lyricist, because I'd always in the past kind of beaten myself up and unfavorably compared myself to the great lyricists that are Phil and Boone Gould, um, you know, who yes. I kind of grew up with, yes, um, yes as well as you know the the people that i really uh were influenced and you know i really admired like you know stevie wonder and Joni mitchell and so on and paul simon and peter gabriel you know so i I thought these lyrics have got to be proper so i'm 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 gonna leave no stone unturned so when it comes to playing the song live it's like suddenly you've got all the pieces there all together and uh, and it feels like a it is really a re-performance of something um, right. that you never really performed because in the studio, you know, you do one bit at a time. You don't do it all at once. And uh, the only idea, time you get an idea of how it is all at once is when you're kind of mixing it. Um, but it's still not the same as performing it live. Mm. So uh, it, right. it, it, it was it was just such a pleasure to, to know that I'd got songs that I could feel really proud of and lyrics that I could feel really proud of. And, and, the lyrics took on new resonances during that show um you know because uh, i could really feel certain as i was singing them i could feel them landing in the room in a way that i just couldn't have imagined and fantastic uh, and you know I, I mean i couldn't obviously tell what everyone was thinking and feeling but i could <laughs> feel you know you, you can with experience you know if you sing a phrase you can feel it kind of land in the room and resonate, you know, even without seeing anything. It's just, it's just like an energy thing. And so that was one of the really wonderful aspects of, of, of the show. Well, I, I tell you, you know, launching, you know, the first single you released from Changes 2 was Time to Let Go. And what, an, unfortunately, of course, but what an unfortunate time for that to come out, but it was also sort of an appropriate time for that to come out because um one hearing new music from you while we were all going through that terrible terrible pandemic uh yeah. it, it 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 like you just said it resonated in a different way as a, as i'm sure you didn't write it specifically for the pandemic but no in fact i wrote it i wrote it in 2019 uh, you know i wrote those words and really? when the pandemic happened i was talking to mike and tony thinking maybe i need to rewrite these lyrics because maybe they're not appropriate anymore and then i kind of thought about it and thought well you know even though we're not busy busy because we're 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 locked in and on zoom and so on i think it's still relevant what i said and uh um and i kind of always also thought that when this thing is over then it's probably going to be a default that a lot of us will start you know, end up being just as busy as we were before the pandemic. So uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll keep the words as they were. And um, and I think they worked, as it were, in both situations enough. <laughs> True. Yeah. True. It's one of those things you don't appreciate till something hits the fan kind of thing, you know, it makes you appreciate exactly. what, you, what, you, what you've always had. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, you know, that, that's the wonderful thing about lyrics is, is you write them you know, as the writer, you write them with a particular concept in mind, and then people will take them and run, and they'll have all kind of different meanings that they'll attach to them. And they're all right, you know, that each yeah. person's interpretation is exactly how it should be, you know, there, mm. there isn't, it's, it's not for me to say, actually, that wasn't what the song was about, you know, it's kind of like, um, I, there's a famous story of, um, I think it was a guy from somewhere like Germany who turned up at, uh, in at John Lennon's house and was yeah. knocking on his door and saying, you know, when you wrote that, that, those lyrics carry that weight, you know, that was, you were really talking about my life. And John said something like, you know, I didn't write the words, Paul wrote them, but you know, <laughs> come in and have a chat. And I think he invited him for a cup of tea or something. Yeah. That and, video is uh, crazy. I have not seen that, but oh I, gosh. I feel that way. I don't, when I was a kid and I love music because there was music always in the house with my mom and the stereo. I just assumed, oh, 
the guy that's singing that, he wrote that. Right? Yes, exactly. But And then I learned, oh, no, uh, he actually didn't. And then you find out that, you know, oh, I know what this means. Like, this really speaks to me. And then if you happen to hear the songwriter explaining the song, it's like, oh, I was totally wrong. But it still <laughs> speaks to me. But overall, exactly. though, Mike, you know, I was reading the liner notes of Changes 2 yesterday as we kind of transitioned to talking about the album. And you say, my wish is that some of these themes will resonate with you. And, you know, Mikey and Winston and I have these conversations over the summer and throughout 2023 that the themes really did resonate. I, I've, I've joked that uh, I'm basically, I have no soul, no emotion, but I was like moved by stuff and about making change in the world and, and in yourself. Um, so mission accomplished on that. Um, it was a very moving album, <clears throat> excuse me. And um I just think you did such a great job on it. I, I wanted to ask about Atlantia right off the top. Um, yeah. Shards of the Divine. The first time I hear Atlantia <clears throat> and I hear the word Shards of the Divine, I'm like, that's an amazing lyric. That is, I, first of all, I've never heard that before anywhere. Um, but it's so relatable, no matter what your faith is, no matter if you have a faith, it's just something that really registered where did that come from um i suppose it, it kind of evolved really the, the, conceptually um uh i'd heard um um some years before i don't know where i was probably doing some kind of course and someone was talking about either human beings or love um as being like the facets of a diamond you know that the facets are all different and might oh, show up in different okay. colors right. but it's the same diamond and so it, it was kind of that idea that then i kind of translated into charles divine i was sitting down with mike pato mm -hmm. you know we kind of co-wrote those lyrics together um you know, I came up with a lot of the verse ideas and, and then we come, we were really working on the chorus together. And it, it just felt, you know, once the theme had started to emerge, because, you know, with some songs, you kind of know what you want to write about and then you have to figure out a way to do it. With other songs, you don't really know what you're writing, but it, you feel like it's, it's, it's wanting to emerge and you'll only really know what it is when you've written it and completed it. And that's the kind of the strange alchemy of, of songwriting sometimes. And so, uh, you know, when I was writing with Mike and, and thinking about, you know, the fact that we all have different faces and mm -hmm. you can make, you can look at someone and think that they're this or think that they're that just based on what your upbringing is and what your cultural upbringing is and, you know, your opinions about, you know, differences between people. And uh, and I just kind of wanted to say, yes, we are all different, but we're all kind of all the same underneath. And of course, that's been said in so many ways by so many different artists. Right. But I was trying to find a way to say it in the context of the lyrics we were writing. And and the phrase just sort of came and it, it just sort of made sense. And uh, um, and, you know, and I wasn't really thinking I need to find an inspirational way of saying it it just kind of flowed in the in the lyric writing session and it seemed to fit and uh you know we i suppose we kind of got into the zone as we were doing that and yeah um, and that's what came out it's a great line thank yeah, you i would uh piggyback on that like that track immediately hit me musically hell of a groove mm -hmm. but those first lines you know that's my situation right half hmm. black half white you know, and, you know, growing up where I did really close to New York, New Jersey, where Bob's from as well, mm. there's a lot of that. And you, you kind of have to deal with both sides of that, of that identity. But I grew up, my connection with Level 42 was with Starchild. That groove mm. for Atlantia just quickly, just that made me think if I never heard another song after Starchild, 
this groove is the cousin of that groove. <laughs> and I just, I, I probably listened to that song every day when that single got released. Yep. More than one time. I don't, I tend not to do that a lot. Like, it's almost like I don't want to wear out my love of a, of a track. Yeah, I know what that you mean. Hasn't, that hasn't happened. That is just such a wonderful song. And again, what I love about Level 42 was the lyrics aren't always let's dance. Baby, yeah. I love you. <laughs> there's all there's just deeper stuff there. So I can drop the music out. Not that I can technically do that and just listen to a nice poem or whatever. But together, it just it just works. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, Atlantia, you know, became the groove it did, you know, in the studio after a, a couple of experiments. If you heard the, the original demo, you know, a lot of the original demos of this album, um, you know, you probably laugh almost uh, because it's, there were such sketches. And Atlantia, you know, the, the, the way that that evolved for me uh, as a composer was um, I got delivery of this new uh, synth, this uh, the sequential Rev2, which is a kind of profit, you know, modern profit derivative after the profit eight. And uh, I found this uh, arpeggiated uh, thing and uh, I recorded it and I really liked the way that it was kind of and going round and round like that yeah. and then um i sort of broke out one of my favorite patches um which is um another profit patch uh which has got the I, i'm gonna get a bit techy here but it's got the oscillators tuned in fifths so if you play one note you've got you've got two notes a fifth apart so you've got like a c and a g yep. yes. and uh, and when you play chords it does really interesting things that slightly unexpected and i've always loved that sound and i just came i came up with more or less the chord sequence of atlantia and i had this kind of um sort of apple loot strum beat which was really nothing like the groove it turned out to be but i knew it was sort of a placeholder anyway and when we got in the studio we tried a couple of things and we tried to go one way and then um and then suddenly um tony or mike pulled out this four on the floor thing which, you know, kind of seemed obvious, but when it went down and, and, and Mike kind of, you know, suggested the do 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 bass line, it's like, yes. yes. And, and, and then it was almost like, and they were saying, well, we're not sure if this is it. Maybe we should try something else. And I'm like, no, stop, stop. We got it. We got it. We got it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> this is it. And, uh, and, and, and my son, Angelo, who um, he's now 19, so he would have been, you know, 17, 18, when he first heard the kind of first rough demos of that, even before it, you know, I had, before the top line and before the lyrics and before the melody. Mm -hmm. And Angelo just absolutely loved that groove. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, he, he put it on his playlist and, you know, it was his favorite. And, um, and that was kind of, for me, that was a confirmation. I thought, this is the direction this song needs to go. It mustn't change from here because my son says it's great. And yeah, there you go. <laughs> Doesn't get better than... I, I, I really loved... So I, I love the song and then the remix drops. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I love this. It's taking me back to the clubs in New York. <laughs> but the only thing that I didn't like about the remix, which is a compliment of the song, is towards the end... He yeah. leaves out the Nickel Thompson and the Walsh, the, the horns. Yeah, a bit. yeah. And I'm like, and I was, and when it got to that part, I'm like, oh, I really miss that. That horn arrangement is just stellar. I love, the, I love the horns on that. So it's like, man, I need to get those tracks so I could remix it and put those back in. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of it's it's interesting. Um, you know that that first instrumental version that my son love so much that was before the horns as well right. uh, it was just the chords and the drums and the bass and the groove and the changes and he just loved it the way it was so kind of when dave lee did his remix and decided not to use the horns i thought well I, yeah I, I thought i can get that i can get why he hasn't put the horns in because the horns do add something but they sort of take it in another direction and i could see yes. that he didn't want to go in that direction but then i thought well that's fine because the beauty of remixes is if you've got the original version, the, the version that you want as the artist to be out, it's already there. 
so then people can choose and some people might like the remix better and some people might not you know it's like the comments right. on youtube for the time to let go remixes you know the two versions that louis vega did yes. you know some people really like the you know uh, the the a version and some people like the b version and some people say no it's not as good as the original and it's like great you've got to, you've got a choice there. <laughs> but there you go you have it it's it, yeah you have your choice you know choose a weapon there you go <laughs> <laughs> i know i have a backhanded compliment mike in uh you can't just live as an island oh yeah uh, um awesome track i was in, actually in new york city when i heard it for the first time oh yeah and and uh my only complaint is that at the end uh this guitar comes comes back and then there's just a guitar jam and i'm like oh give it going give it going give it going it fades out um yeah but it's a, you know some of us want these songs to go on for nine to ten minutes mike so you can't you can't satisfy everybody <laughs> well you know then that's that's the beauty of live because you know i could live the guitar solo happened and it was a proper guitar solo and uh right. so um you know i mean the, the thing is that the, the track needed to fade at some point the song right. was kind of over lyrically so that's mm -hmm. why it faded when it is but there's always also there's also a bit of kind of i mean it's nothing underhand but you kind of there is a part of you which knows that it's sometimes it's a good thing to leave the audience wanting more and um, absolutely. Uh, absolutely i mean i have i have favorite stevie tracks where he goes into a jam at the end just as it's fading out it's like no <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Wait, um, that reminds that reminds me mike of rolling stone did a um a review of world machine oh yeah and they said that the best track was World Machine, but it faded out too soon. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It was like, yeah, there's a whole thing on, I saw a video on YouTube, which was brilliant, where a guy was discussing like the top 10 songs where, and I think it was a bass player centered video where the bass groove really picks up as the song is fading out. Yep. Yeah. Which I thought was, and I remember being in Greenwich Village in Manhattan when abc dropped tears are not enough yes i was in i distinctly remember i was leaving a clothing store and as i'm walking out they had the music cranked so loud that you could hear the last eight bars and it was just a very funky bass line ah. and i go back in the store like what's that song <laughs> and that's how that's how i wound up buying that record and i remember yeah. playing the vinyl and when it got to the end just cranking it up and all the noise obviously cranking up, but that got me into ABC. Just that little bass line fade out at the end of the song. So I, um, well, yeah, that's that's great. I mean, the, the, in fact, there's I reckon there's a whole podcast there, right there, on yeah, endings yeah. of songs that, that fade out too soon. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a whole podcast there. I could certainly come up with a load of tracks that do that. I mean, that's you know, great. for example, the you know the album version of something about you it kind of goes into a bass solo right at the right. The, the, the fade out there right right and uh you know for some people who like their bass solos you know they, they probably would have liked to have heard more of that but um well it's funny i when that came out i was kind of like all right so level 42 is doing their songwriting thing you know they wanted to kind of move away from you know take it to the next level and i remember mark saying you know maybe the bass takes a back seat and then they have this killer single, but right at the end, there it is. There's a little solo just to remind folks. Yes. This guy's still going to be a bass player, you know, Mike on changes to the, the track all for love. Yeah. This one, this one's got me puzzled. I, I'm listening to it and I, it, it, it came across to me as a song, a, lo a love song, but then the more I listened to it, it, was like a song about love and then you know as we were talking about earlier about interpretation of lyrics yeah the, the more i listened to it I, I i wanted to say it was a song about mike lindup and t talking to his persona mike lindup all these years or or or, le or level 42 about about your relationship with level 42 a am i way off the mark um it wasn't about that no but you know like i don't want to pour 
water on your interpretation. <laughs> That's an interesting lens to look at the lyrics of the song through, which obviously I haven't considered until this moment. You mentioned it. Um, I mean, you know, you don't want to explain exactly what the song was about because you might sort of deflate a whole load of balloons that are, are out there. Understand, but, understand. Um, but I mean, I, I would, you know, safe to say it, it wasn't written about that. But the, okay. there is a bit of sweet element to it. You know, it was written about a relationship that was kind of not in its sort of prime, but it was written in the hope that that could come back. Uh, that's that's okay. all I'll say about that song. Sure, sure. It, uh, yeah, I just, I thought it was uh, you, you, you enjoying Mike Lindup as Mike Lindup and, and, and then embracing who Mike Lindup is when he's performing. It, it just... It, it it just stuck with me, so I had to ask that one. Okay. Well, I'm that's gonna, very, very interesting. I'm <laughs> going to pivot to another song, Mike. Uh, David, goodbye to you. Yeah. You know, I'm not a huge Bowie fan. I do like him. Um, and I'm not even sure if the song is 100% about David Bowie, but I, I thought your... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Your... The way you delivered it was really Bowie-esque. Did I? Am I reading that incorrectly? I mean, it, it sounds like Bowie could have sang that song. Well, that's very nice of you to say. And in fact, if you'd have heard the demo, then I would have sounded even more like Bowie because, <laughs> in a way, his death inspired the song. Um, it was one of those things where I was sat in a, a bedsit somewhere in the UK on the Thriller Live tour, and. Uh, suddenly this headline came on that he was dead and it knocked me for six in a way I just wasn't expecting because I right. would have said like you I'm you know I would never have called myself a Bowie fan it's just that you know he was always there he was like part of the firmament you know yeah. along with McCartney and Mick and Keith and all of that sort of thing he was just there and you know he'd written some great songs and they'd been part of my growing up you know I remember discovering you know Ziggy Stardust album at someone's house and playing it and really liking the groove of the first track five years and and then you know life on Mars and trying to work that out at the piano when I was at music school you know instead of practicing Chopin or Beethoven or whatever right. <laughs> right. um and yeah you know and I and he, I knew he'd just done this album Black Star and also he'd done this show which had just come out and it looked like he was just you know, on another level and, and, you know, going into another area or artistically, which is, you know, which reinvention was something that I think one of the things he helped to invent was the art of reinventing oneself. <laughs> and so it was, it, but it was, it was, it was something else, it was something else about him dying. And I realized afterwards that what it might have been reminding me of was, was losing my dad. And I don't know why, um, but it, it, kind of my dad's sort of died, I think, younger than, you know, before his time, if you like. You know, he right. was 65, I think. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I was just in floods of tears in this little bedsit, thinking, why am I crying about David Bowie? You mm -hmm. know, um, but I was. And so, and then this, this, the kind of the song started to flow out of me. You know, I grabbed my laptop and started to play the chords. And then a bit later on, I sort of, came up with a melody and I was singing as if it was Bowie, you know, what mel what would Bowie have composed over this? So that's kind of where I was coming from. Not in a way to try and copy him, no, no, but no. just to sort of, his spirit was kind of in me as I was composing the song. So yes, there, it's, it's great that you say that because I, I was, you know, there were echoes of me, you know, trying to come up with a melody line that would, that would be something that he might've sung. And then the song is about him. But it was also about my dad in a way, not necessarily literally in terms of the right. lyrics, but just the feeling of, of loss. And then as I was recording the vocals, the day I was recording the vocals and we'd hired a special mic in um, to get a kind of more intimate sound. And I got us this phone call from Mark, you know, saying that Boone had died, oh, and, gosh, and, and which was just, again, not me for six and um 
uh you know and we talked a, a bit about that and then i had to kind of go back and do these lyrics because we you know, had this microphone for a day or something on hire and mm -hmm. you know i had the lyrics already so i was thinking of boone and i thought about rewriting the song to make it about boone but i thought no i'm going to stick to the original idea but kind of boone's in there as well yeah so when i'm talking about you know bowie's legacy i'm all i was also thinking about boone's legacy as a as a songwriter so you know there's a, it's a sort of three-part thing to that yeah. lyric in a way i just well, think the melody line is so poignant i don't know why it's just you don't need to be a musician to feel it. It's just, it was something really great. Well done on it. Thank I, uh, you. Mike, honestly, I, 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 I don't skip any track on, on changes too. It's one of the rare albums that I listen to every track. I don't skip one. I listen to everything. Um, and David, goodbye to you. Every time I listen to the end of that track, one, it's beautiful, but the way you ended the track, it, I have tears in my eyes um because it's like you just said and you didn't know i was going to say this but you know my dad died at 49 he was very young mm -hmm. and uh, it, it it uh if there's someone who's passed away that's so important to you and you listen to this track you're putting your your own emotions in this track and by the end of it you're interested i don't know how you knowing what you just said to us i don't know how you got through the end of that song <laughs> uh, yeah. just the passion in it is just beautiful and very heartfelt Thank you. I mean, that that's that's beautiful to hear. Um, in fact, I played, I played the track, um, a sort of a, an almost finished mix to a, a an old school friend of mine who was visiting from Hong Kong, and she just lost her mum, and um, she she kind of she said you should rename it, uh, you know, say it's about my mum because it, I just you know she could just completely relate to it from from her experience. Mm. So um i guess there's something of of you know of, of the loss there that um that i captured thinking about who you know what i was thinking about but it, it's it's beautiful when you know as i said before other people take your song and they put their own meaning it means something else to them and that's exactly as it as it should be well it, it was stunning mike and, and i know you i wanted to mention a little bit about world is ready because again another stellar, incredible track. But when you recorded World is Ready, I, I listened to another interview, you said that uh, Ursula's mom had passed away right before she recorded that. Yeah, it, yeah, and my, my, I, when I called her up, you know, it was it was Tony's idea to um, contact Ursula, because I was trying to think of, you know, someone else, because I, you know, like, like you've heard on the album, I kind of thought it would be nice to have some guest vocalists as well as guest musicians, you know, so, um, you know, and it's not that I'm a downer on myself and saying, well, no one wants to hear my voice on all 12 tracks, but it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> it's an opportunity to have variety and to get other, you know, other sounds and other voices. And, and um, so Tony suggested us that, and I eventually got a, a number for her. Um, and when I called her up, you know, she she said that, you know, she'd been in this place where she'd lost her mum and, and she was kind of, uh, um, you know, really happy that I'd called and invited her to do something creative um, you know, at that time when she was feeling vulnerable. And so it was, yeah, it was, that was just the timing of it. And uh, and then she went and laid down her thing uh, and... Um, she she did a, the, the the bits of singing you hear. She did that first, um, but I kind of knew of her. The little I knew of her was as as a kind of poet, if you like. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I, I asked her to sort of if she could go back and also speak the words, and then we could have them speaking as well as sung. And so she did that, and and it um, just really fitted. And she really took the theme because I'd already written the choruses, so all of those words. I'd written and uh, I just said to her, you know, just take that and run. And, and that's what she did. And uh, she related to, to it from, from her point of view. And she'd been dealing with a lot of stuff as well as losing her mum. And, and she, you know, she was kind of uh, representing, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, but she was kind of representing 
um, kind of artists and poets and also her community and the black community in Philadelphia. And, mm -hmm. you know, we just come out of the Black Lives Matter thing. Mm -hmm. And so there were other resonances that she had and that she could hear in the words and that she sort of put into the song, um, you know, which, 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 which was just great because, uh, like I say, I kind of written the choruses and I didn't know what else the song was about, but I had an idea. I had ideas. So I just threw ideas up and she just came back and just really nailed it. I thought uh, it, it was brilliant, Mike, honestly. I think that, I think that world is ready is the fi my favorite song among many favorite songs on that album. I think it's tremendous. I love Mike. the, it's almost like, um, the chorus is a mantra in mm. a way it, it's, like I think back to Madness on the uh, on the one album, which is also uh, a mantra, but this is more more, more melodic mantra, I guess. Um, the one question I wanted to ask you about it is: Mark King does play bass on it. Um, yes. Uh, was that a big ask uh, for you to make of him, uh, or and once you had it, how did you want to mix it? Um, it was, yeah, I mean, it kind of was, I mean, the thing is I played him, uh, I played him the demo of world is ready. Um, and what it had was the, it had the chorus, but it didn't, the chorus, um, didn't have any words. So it was just doing that, do that, do that, do that, do that, do man, oh no. And, um, I remember actually I played the demo to my mum um, earlier and this this version and uh i said to mum i i think mum kind of liked it and i quite liked it the fact that it didn't have words um mm -hmm. but then when i sort of brought into mike and tony mike kind of went yeah you need words <laughs> i'm mm -hmm. like oh all right then <laughs> I'll, I'll think of some words god damn it um <laughs> But I, I'd, I'd play the demo to Mark. Uh, uh, we were at an airport waiting for a flight or something, and I saw his head nodding, and I thought it'd be lovely to get him to play on it. So I asked him if he'd be prepared to play on it, and um, and he sort of he recorded the bass, and he you know at, at home on the Isle of Wight, and he sent me the tracks, and uh, I got Miles Bald, you know, to do the drums. He was he was in Canada. This is during lockdown. Mm -hmm. And so he was stuck in Canada. So, but he put the tra tracks down at a studio. He was working there, and it was a case of marrying it up. But again, from a production point of view, you know, the, it could have been it could have been much more kind of live bass and live drums. But right. Mike and Tony, again, they they didn't want it to go in that direction production wise. They thought it would be more interesting to take the the kind of demo drums you know the drum machine that i had on the original demo which i was quite attached to but not lock solid but they said they really liked that so they wanted the the live drums and, and the live bass to kind of be mixed in with the 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 sort of program drums and the moog bass right. so that it, it was it was it was neither one thing or the other and you know i'm not i know i've heard from a couple of people who said you know that the bass could have been louder and <laughs> yes you're right it, it mark's bass could have been louder um which would have made it more of a feature of him but i think in terms of yes. how the, the the song wanted to be served um it was kind of it we chose to do it that way you know between us and i mean i'm not saying that i was necessarily always in agreement you know we did have a bit of a fight about levels about what should be loud and what shouldn't be not just about the bass and sure. not just on this track you know there were some you know frank discussions at times but in the end i thought well <laughs> they're producing me i've come to them because i want them to take me in a different direction so if they're really feeling strongly about how it should sound then i'm going to go with it yeah i don't know i thought the bass had some good subtlety, actually. I wasn't looking for it to be, uh, you know, a Mark King show at that point. No, but I was just curious about it. Yeah, I have a, well, I do have a tech follow-up question. That kind of answered one of my questions. I was curious um, if everyone recorded in the studio or did anyone work digitally? And obviously Mark did, which you just explained. Um, was everything else recorded in the studio? You you mean, did did the people who are on the album come to the studio to record. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Well, no, that wasn't possible, again, because of the lockdowns. So Alex Hutchings did his oh, right. Time to Let Go guitar solo at his own studio. I mean, he would have come in and we would have loved him and he would have loved to have been in there. He said he right. much prefers to be in the room, but it just wasn't possible. It, it just wasn't allowed. So he did the tracks at home. Mark did his bass at home. Um, Ursula obviously did her vocals in Philadelphia. Miles did um, the drums for David and World is Ready in Canada at the studio that he was in. Um, um, let's see. So Alan Salmon, who, who plays amazing rhythm guitar, he came yes. in, so he did that in the studio. Dominic came down to the studio to do his guitar parts. Uh, Manu did the drums on All for Love in France because, again, of lockdown and, and yeah. convenience, and he lives there. So so it was a kind of mixture of things. The the um, So Samadou and... Um, Lucita and Vanessa came in and they did their vocals in the studio. It was great. Um, Rob, uh, oh Lord, the names escape me now. Uh, the guy, uh, oh, I can't say the guy who played bass on. That's such a we'll difficult thing. We'll Wait a minute. I, I, when, I, when I catch his name, uh, Hold on, we'll give it to Rob, you. Rob Malarkey. So yes. Rob Malarkey, he came into the studio. He actually lives around the corner from Tony and Mike, although you know, he's normally on tour with, with uh, Jacob Collier, so he was quite mm. hard to pin down, but eventually I did, and he came in and did that on David, which was great, because mm. we wanted fretless bass. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah and and he did that on fretless, and it was just a joy to watch him do that. So, and, and Yolanda came in, she did her basses in the studio, which was just brilliant. So it was a mixture of things. Yeah, I guess I got, I forgot about when it was recorded. And, but then I saw a video that you posted of folks in the studio, you drumming a bit, and you really need to release some of that stuff, if it's possible. Just like well, seeing you play drums for eight seconds is not enough. Well, I mean, that unfortunately, that's all I've got, a clips. You know, I have oh, a okay. whole drum track recorded. You know, okay. I, you know I, I just wanted... I just wanted some clips for mementos and, you know, bits for social media. I, d I right. didn't want to sort of, I wasn't thinking, well, I'm going to do a whole video of me playing this live uh, yeah, because I, I at the stage that. I was laying the drums down, you know, the, tr the track was really under construction. It was a scaffold, um, you know, uh, it, it, it didn't become, it, there were no lyrics. There were, the final melody wasn't written. So, uh, right. that was just the way it is. But I mean, thank you for saying that I am going to, put out more of the studio clips though um probably on on the uh on the band camp yep. um fan hub and okay. maybe some bits on youtube as well <laughs> eventually because you know I, i'm sure that people who love the album would like to see some more of that behind the scenes but there'll yeah. be a few eyebrows being raised at, at certain things you know in terms <laughs> of the state they were in when they arrived in the studio i'm sure oh uh, well i uh, there's a track that i i love the, i saw you in my dreams with omar Oh, yeah. Um, and I bought the album, you know, I have a, well, both of my sisters are fans of the band, of you. I bought a copy from my younger sister, Elaine. I sent it to her. And within, I don't know, later in that evening, she calls me up and she's like, she, she loved that song. And she's like, she just saw that it just says featuring Omar. Yeah. She's like, I know that guy. She's like, there's this guy that was on EastEnders and this sounds like him. <laughs> Now I only know him as a singer. I had no idea that he did a bit of acting. So I look it up and I'm like, yeah, it's the same guy. And That's wow, amazing. that you recognized him from watching this TV show, which she still watches, by the way. Um, in fact, in fact, well, the funny thing is that um, the day he came down, because uh, he lives in Brighton, so the day mm -hmm. he came down to the studio in North London, he just filmed, um, you know, EastEnders. I think his first thing. Okay. And, and we had to basically sign an NDA, you know, orally to not say anything about it because it wasn't public knowledge, you know, because obviously they film it before they broadcast it. Yeah. But he literally landed the, the East Enders gig the day he, you know, or the day after he, the, he came down to do the vocal on I Saw You In My Dreams. <laughs> yes, that's I, I just thought that was amazing that she picked that voice out of a television program. And oh, yeah, of course, song. his speaking voice. Yeah. yeah or amazing. did he do a bit of singing? I can't. I, I didn't. I, I watch don't it. know. She didn't say, but I assumed hmm. it was just. But he may have. He may have sung on the show. I'll have to have to bug her about that. But I just thought yeah. that was funny. Um, and uh, I did have another question, which just 
really kind of slipped my mind. Well, actually, I have a question that mm. was given to me by a good friend of mine, Angel, who lives in Los Angeles. She's a professional singer. Uh, she's a big fan of the band, and you, of course. She actually got engaged at a two, 2015 gig in London at the Indigo. Oh, right. Uh, big fan. So she was asking, um, when did you realize early in your career that you could do well singing the high notes? Uh, I don't think it was a realization. It was just, um, it was kind of like, uh a combination of the way that we as a band you know wrote songs and came up with melodies um you know in the early days we'd write in a kind of rehearsal studio situation um there was a place up near old street called the works which was rented like five days a week and we we'd be in there all day with a ghetto blaster and we're right. just jamming around ideas trying to come up with something and if we thought it was any good, we'd record it onto the Ghetto Blaster. And then the next day we'd come in and review the ideas on this kind of somewhat distorted cassette recordings. Um, and, you know, then like if there was one idea, then maybe Phil would say, oh, I've got another melody that might go with that. Mm. And Phil often came up with melodies in falsetto because that's just the way the melodies came to him. Mm -hmm. And then it'd be like, Mike, can you sing that? You know, because I had a a sort of, a, if you like, a better falsetto voice than Phil, um, yeah. certainly in, at that stage. Um, although Phil would sometimes, you know, sing along as well. Right. So uh, that was, uh, and then sometimes if we wrote a chorus, then it'd be good to harmonise it. And so I'd harmonise with Mark or sometimes he'd harmonise with, with me or sometimes it'd be like, let's double it, but you sing it the octave up. And it's something that I could do without thinking really. So I just did it. And um, we weren't trying to create a, a sort of trademark, but I guess, you know, unconsciously, of course, there's, yeah. you know, previous to this, you know, like uh, um, Earth, Wind and Fire and, yeah. you know, bands like that where they will have, you know, the, the falsetto and, and the low voice and sometimes they'd be sort of doing stuff in octaves and so on. So it just seemed like right. a natural thing to do and, and it sort of became a thing and then I became known for the guy that sings the high bits. Right. Yeah, because she also was wondering, she's like, well, when did you first start studying music? Did your parents kind of push you towards it? Or did they just see that you're in a house full of music, musicians, he's gravitating towards this? How did that work? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's exactly it. I mean, my, both my mum and my dad were musicians. So uh, my mum uh, was a, a singer-songwriter. I mean, I mean, she's still alive. She's 99. Yeah, um, amazing. And... Uh, but yes, yeah, so she she had a career as as a singer and songwriter and actor, and um, so she'd be you know writing at home. The the sitting room was kind of like my playroom, and the sitting room had a piano. It had mum's guitar. It had some kind of African hand drums. It had an auto harp, and it had a it it, it had a reel to reel tape recorder that mum used to record her rehearsals with. Mm -hmm. Um, that I was then allowed to have a go on at times. And of course it had a radiogram. We had a, you know, a record player unit cabinet with all this kind of different eclectic records and music. So that was my, that was my growing up playroom. So I started mucking about on the piano when I was about three and trying to work things out. I'd heard on the TV, of, you know, theme tunes to Thunderbirds or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and then started having lessons when I was six. And my dad was a composer arranger who wrote for kind of TV and, and films and library music. And, and although my mum and dad split up, I mean, he kind of left when I was about four or five. I still have memories of him kind of early days up in his little study, sort of bashing out stuff. And uh, um, so that it was kind of, Music was just something I did. Music and drawing and bird watching were like ah. the three big things in my life when I was a kid. You know, I'd get on my bike and I grew up in Wimbledon, which is quite a green, you know, there's there's Wimbledon Common and Richmond Park. It's a very green part of London to grow up in. So yeah. I could sort of get on my bicycle and ride out into kind of what felt like nature and 
and we be sort of bird watching and you know musing and come back and go in the sitting room and sort of playing the piano or you know if i got told off or if i'm in a bad mood or something you know then i'd <laughs> work it out on the piano it became <laughs> i mean it didn't become a therapist but it was somewhere i could go to express feelings that i couldn't put a voice to or, or you know couldn't think through any other way yeah. and uh yeah so that's really how how music came into my life well, the piano is a percussion instrument, right? Sure. And and then later on, you know, when I got my, my dad bought me a drum kit just as I was about to go to music college. And, you know, I was playing drums in a sort of cover version band at college um, before I met Phil and, and then, you know, later Mark. Um, but uh, I had the drum set up at home in the sitting room. So, you know, I could come home and, and you know, Gosh. again, it's a, it's fantastic anger management getting on the drum kit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, um, we've had you for a long time. I just wanted to ask one last question on changes too, uh, that I don't think I heard on any other interview you've done. What was okay. the reaction of any of your bandmates, either past, current, whatever? Uh, any kind of reactions to the album that you got from those guys? Um, nothing directly, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, like Mark came along to the launch at Spirit right. Land at the end of July, you know, which I really appreciated and, you know, kind of said more in a way than words could say that he would support me in that way. Um, yeah, Nathan because, was at know, the uh, Jazz Cab Faith show, I think, right? Sorry? Was Nathan at the Jazz Cab Faith show too? Um, I, I, I don't. Sure. I don't know. I, I haven't. I I haven't seen him or spoken to him. Okay. Um. Since and I mean, there were a lot of people there. I I didn't invite him, but um, <laughs> I think he was playing up the road and heard about it. I think okay. that's what I heard. So I don't know if he popped in or not. Okay. But um, right. you know, uh, you know, some some of the some some of the guys, you know, the other guys in the band. I mean, obviously the brass, you know, Nickel obviously was on the album. So, you know, yeah. he kind of said, you know, nice things about it. And some of the crew heard it and so on. But uh, I've, I've not had a kind of, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a review, if you like, from, from <laughs> any, of, of any of the band members, you know, which is fine. Yeah. Well, it's a great album. And you, should, you know, you should be very proud of it. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Honestly, Absolutely. Mike, this I think that album is kind of the impetus for this podcast, if I could be honest. I mean Absolutely. It brought us together. Yep. Sure oh, did. that's great. So with that, Mike, um, we're gonna pivot to one last subject since we have, you know, you, uh, a co founder of Level Forty Two here, and this is a Level Forty Two fan podcast. Yes. We're gonna do three geek out questions. A piece. We're gonna let Mikey do the first three. Then we'll go to Winston and then myself. And hopefully, there's somewhat rapid fire, so we can get you out of here. Hey, no, <laughs> there's no rush. You know, I've, right. I've I made soup yesterday. It's just sitting out in the in the back porch, chilling, waiting for me to eat it up. So oh, um, it's cold soup. Time. Okay. Oh, cool. Thanks, Mike. Um, we've heard some tracks in Level Forty Two live but that didn't appear on albums. Yeah, uh, track, tracks like Nothing More to Say, uh, Follow Me, and yeah. Morning Silence. Um, why didn't they make an album? Are there finished versions of these tracks, or were these songs that just kind of developed from jams and riffs on stage and you just wanted to see how they played out live? Uh, slightly different story, I think, for the different tracks. So um, what's the first one? Nothing More to Say. Yes. I mean, that's, that's like an early an early kind of Mike Linda led level 42 composition that, that we kind of came up with and, you know, we did it at a few gigs. Um, but it sort of, it, it for, for whatever reason, it just never made, made the whatever album that we were doing at, uh -huh. at the time. Um, and uh, follow me. Yeah. Follow me. Well, follow me was, um, I think, you know, kind of Mark came up with that song and it was written, 
I think it was written uh, so that we had an extra track on the Physical Presence album, really. Um, it was... Uh, I don't actually know what the, what, the, what the reason for writing it was, um, you know, and how long the song had been around, but Mark came up with it and, you know, suggested it'd be, be a good thing that, that, that we had, you know, something on the live album that wasn't available on other albums, as it were. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that's why we recorded that, and um, I think it served its purpose really well. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I, I know "Morning Silence" was another one, but there were two more tracks that I just remembered that I should have put on this list. Yeah, uh, and not a lot of people know about these tracks. They're kind of in the hidden fandom. Uh, yeah. Tracks called a track called "Fire" and a track called "Free Your Soul." Yeah. Um, what what time period are those from? Well, the the so morning silence um i mean that's that's a very early composition of mine that i wrote while i was at college in before level 42 started oh right um, yeah and uh you know we kind of did it in a i think a radio one session um again it never really sort of made it onto an album or you know either a level 42 album or, or a me solo album but it's a sort of recurring theme because i used um that theme or part of it um, along with another theme when I was writing the film score um, to uh, this film called Arifa, which is an independent film that I was oh, asked yes. to do the music for. Yes. And so the, the theme sort of comes up there. I mean, I, I had kind of written some lyrics for it. Um, it's just a very early song and uh, it, it kind of feels like it's, I don't know if you were an artist, you'd say, yeah, this is this is this is kind of one of my works when I'm still trying to work out who I am kind of thing, mm, you see. know, rather than this says this about me, blah, blah, blah. At that time, <laughs> you know, it was kind of work in progress composition in in effect. Um, and uh, and I'm, I've never felt the urge to really do anything more with it or, or revisit it or update it or whatever. And, and And then I used it in that film thing. So it's kind of like. And then I saw a few comments saying, hang on a minute, isn't this part of Morning Silence? I thought, um, <laughs> I, I can't use it. <laughs> um, um, the, 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 the fire track and... Fire, the track Sorry about fire that. and Free Yourself, they were... Um, so we were um, working in the studio, Mark's studio in the Summer House in the Isle of Wight, and with a, a producer, composer, yeah, and kind of remixer called Peter Lorimer. Um, oh, yes. In, 90s when we're doing the forever now album and some of the stuff we did with him ended up on the album and these tracks again there were it's like we were trying to find a, a sort of different direction that was um because you know we'd come out with um get the scars of the whole kind of polydor divorce um you know which was a, it was a really tough time because we we'd recorded the guaranteed album and Polydor had decided that it wasn't commercially viable and uh, our lawyer believed that it was. And then we got into this big kind of legal thing and it was all going to go to the high court about whether this was a commercial album or not. Um, and we were really upset that Polydor didn't want to release it because we thought we'd really done a great album and we'd done the best album that we could do. And, and also we kind of felt like, kind of give us a break. You know, we've, we've, we've done really well. And maybe not every album is going to be a running in the family, you know, in terms of sales. I mean, there was a recession going on in the UK. Mm -hmm. Sales were really dropping. And I think the, the, you know, the record companies or the shareholders, the people that, that pull the purse strings were kind of putting pressure on saying, you know, look, um, you know, something's wrong. With, you know, sales are dropping. So maybe, right. you know, maybe, maybe Level 42 need to get together with other people to write their songs. You know, there was this, all these conversations going on in the court case. And in the middle of it, we had this run of 15 shows at Hammersmith, um, <laughs> you know, which was like, well, why, if, if, our, if our writing isn't that good, why have we got like 15 sold out shows at Hammersmith? So exactly. So, so that's the background. So the, the fire and the free yourself were kind of like, we were trying to find a new direction. And I think that, eventually we kind of thought you know they're okay but i'm not really sure that they're what we want to do is level 42 if they're kind of really level 42 songs they might be songs that maybe someone else might like to do um but yeah so they they just 
you know, I, there were quite a few tracks that didn't end up on the Forever Now album. Um, and th- we did a quite a lot of rewriting on that album as well. So they they are kind of of that period, sort of on the way to the Forever Now album. And that, uh, that's amazing to, to to learn that. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and ask my second question because Mike just kind of touched on it. You know, with Polydor, uh, you know, giving you guys grief about Guaranteed, um, mm. and you just said, you know, you guys have come off the the, the sellouts at Hammersmith Odeon. And just the year before that, you were the house band at the Princess Trust in 1989, which yeah. if I had a time machine, I would go back to. That would be one of my stops, is to mm-hmm. see that performance. Uh, my question is, with all the artists in the music royalty, what was that experience like for you and for Level 42 of, uh, of taking part in that Princess Trust 89 show? Oh, it was... Uh... It was amazing. Um, um, you know, it was a lot of work, uh, as usual, because there are all these different artists. Um, and, you know, we had to obviously learn all of their songs, which is fine. I mean, that's that's kind of what we did. Um, and they come down to the studio and some would come down and be kind of happy with what they heard. Other ones would sort of, you know, a couple of people brought their own MDs and the MDs had ideas about how we should sound and how they're going to arrange things. So. We were sort of accommodating all of that, um, but knowing it was, you know, a real privilege to be chosen as the house band um, to, for all of these different artists. And then, you know, the icing on the cake was going to be the fact that George Martin was going to be conducting the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. So it wasn't just going to be a band; it was going to be an orchestra, and you know, plus George Martin at the helm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was just, it was, it was a brilliant experience, and uh, I. You know, I can remember moments of of the rehearsals and moments of the sound checks, and you know, little kind of side conversations. Like I remember having a conversation with, um, oh God, his name, what? Will going Downing? On? Uh, no, uh, yeah, <laughs> I did speak with him. No, I, I was thinking that. of the the Australian guy, um, the John Farnham. Farnham. John Farnham. Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, he came and he, he did he did a kind of run through um, and, you know, his voice kind of making self-deprecating sort of quip saying, you know, I hate it when I sing flat. And and then he said, but I hate it even more when I sing sharp. <laughs> and, and the irony, of course, was that I couldn't hear him singing either flat or sharp, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, and... Uh, it's funny enough, my, my cousin, Chad, um, who was at the, the gig at the Jazz Cafe, um, just sent me um, a couple of photos last night to say he was back at the Jazz Cafe to see Alex O'Neill. Oh, oh wow. Um, do, doing a gig. And uh, and so it, we had a big sort of long sort of text discussion about how was that. And and then, you know, my my mutual friend, Bilal, um, our mutual friend, yeah, sure yeah, um, was reminding, you know, saying, well, Mike, of course, Mike will remember who that is because um, we did Prince's Trust with him, which we did. Um, and I, I was, I was, I then got onto Spotify and played a couple of the songs of, of that time that I hadn't heard for years and years and years. And, you know, Chad was saying, you know, so, so it was like, you know, just being in, in the, you know, having those people come on stage and all these different artists, you know, in their prime, in their own way and, and, you know, with their own kind of success story and their own style and their own sounds. And then having to sort of adapt to sort of, you know, try and reproduce the best of all. I mean, it was, it was a a fantastic experience. Um, And, uh, you know, and of course, Alan Murphy was with us then and, you know, he was great. Just, just wonderful tremendous uh, you know human being as well as a, a, an amazing sort of musician and guitarist yeah. um and yeah sort of you know will downing and misha paris and uh that was lovely and um you know andy bell doing his you know er- erasure songs and that was great it, it's yeah i mean I, it was a real challenge to me as it had been you know in 1987 being in the house band at wembley sort of coming up with all the keyboard sounds um, to try and make it sound as much like the record as possible. That was the challenge. And uh, I mean, but out of that 1989 Princess Trust, I got, I got, you know, hired by George Martin to do a couple of shows with him, which was just 
brilliant. You know, there really? was a, a John know. Lennon trip. There's a John Lennon tribute show featuring a guy called Victor Spinetti, who who'd mm. known John, who was a kind of actor musician mm. at the festival hall with the London Symphony Orchestra or something with the band. And I was the keyboard player in the band, you know, doing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And <laughs> You know, George Martin saying, that sounds not quite right. Um, can you make it a bit more like this? And, <laughs> um, and then uh, he, di he did, then did a, a production of, of a very famous, a very famous Welsh um, playwright and poet called Dylan Thomas. Yes. Wrote this wonderful um, long sort of story poem called Under Milk Wood. And there was a, a production of that at, at George's then new Air Studios in, in Hampstead. Uh, with an all-star kind of cast mm. led by Anthony Hopkins. And mm. again, I was in the band playing that. And um, so, you know, those two gigs came out of doing the Princess Trust show. And, uh, you know, it was just, you know, it's just, it's just great. And of course, you know, if I could get in a time machine, I would also go back, but I'd sort of be in the audience watching it because uh, <laughs> that's the one thing that I couldn't do. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, get uh, the other angle, the, um, Winston here. Uh, I have a few sort of old school questions. Um, what uh, what recollections do you have of that song that you and Mark did, Freedom? Um, I can sort of remember being in, I think we did it at Vineyard Studios, um, I think. I'm not sure. But anyway, I can remember being in the studio and, um, you know, coming up with, with lines and on the prophet and doing the sort of the the sort of latinish piano overdub and yeah. uh, and guy barker coming in on trumpet and and doing his things and uh, uh it was kind of great fun and it was almost like a a sort of busman's holiday sort of session as it were somehow mm -hmm. it, it seemed to be less kind of i mean it wasn't like they were pressured but it seemed to be it seemed to be more freedom, if you like, um, just working with Mark doing doing that and doing it as a solo thing and knowing it was going to be a kind of, you know, released as a non-level 42 thing with pseudonyms. It was just kind of real fun thing to do. Hmm. Yeah, that was a, a vinyl piece that I found somewhere in Manhattan. I'm like, what in the world is this? I, I didn't yeah. know this existed. And at the time, I didn't know if this was like a solo thing or... Yeah, because it was under it was under level forty two, on the rack, right? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I, you know, you know how it was in Manhattan, Bob. We were hitting so yeah. many record shops. I don't, I don't recall. You know, my <clears throat> big memory was looking for level forty two and always finding levelers. <laughs> oh <know>. yeah, yeah, <laughs> or Levert. <laughs> right. So my second question is, and we've all discussed this, and I'm just curious what your answer might be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all three came to a consensus on this on this track. But what song that of of the bands wasn't a big hit that you thought should have been? Uh, oh, well, I mean, you um, took my question. Okay, leaving me now for a start. You know, I was I wasn't you know convinced it would be a number one in the states, but I was really mm -hmm. hoping that it might be. <laughs> right, <laughs> because right. Um, I thought. I just thought it was such a great song and I thought uh, I could just hear it going down well. And Mark and I had had this little uh, agreement that if we ever got a number one in the US, we'd fly home on Concord. And um, of course, we never did. And so right. we never did. Um, that's one of my biggest regrets is, is never to have flown on Concord. Um, right. And of course, you know, you, you can't say, but... Um, I thought Leaving Me Now could have done better than it did. Um, I thought Love in a Peaceful World definitely should That's have done better than it did. Yep. That's the one that we all agreed on. That's the one we agreed on, yeah. Um, um, you know, that. I mean, I, th I think that um, RCA Records, um, I would say they kind of mismanaged that campaign because absolutely. Forever Now was the first single. That was great. Um, and then... For some reason, they went for "All Over You" as the second single, yeah. and kind of felt like the foot was off the gas. I mean, this was a time when the boy bands were king. You know, take right. that with, with like yes. the That's band, back what we discussed, yeah. And then da dance music was coming in, and so on. And then there was this kind of gap, and it's like, come on, guys, the momentum's going. We need. You know, love in a peaceful world. That's that's great. You know, we sh they sh you should be pulling out all the stops and all of that. 
and you know the the video was kind of I didn't think it was brilliant. It was, you know, there wasn't really much money behind it, and maybe there wasn't much money to it, available, as it were, because there was a recession, as I said, happening in the in the nineties. But I really felt that that was underplayed, and and it it was such a great song, and I mean, it meant a lot anyway, because in a sense, Phil wrote it about Mark showing up on his doorstep unexpectedly. Right. You know, it had a lot of heart, and you know, apart from that interpretation you know um it had such a great message and um yes. steve anderson had produced it and we got you know i did help to do the string arrangement on it and i just thought it was a killer track and it, it should have done a load better than it did oh it is a killer yeah. track yeah the, it is the whole arrangement uh we all yeah we kind of came to a quick consensus like that's the one that got away um i guess my my last question would be I have a question and a half, but growing up in the New York area, like I said, my first introduction was Star Child. Played on the radio, played in all the clubs. We were teenagers. I knew how popular it was because we all kind of wanted to be DJs, my gaggle of friends. And there were a lot of, the town we lived in, were a lot of DJ-oriented record shops. They had the single, but eventually they they had like this double sided bootleg that they were selling of Star Chop because it was in such demand. Like everybody right. wanted that song. You see, it's funny. And then, I, I, we never knew anything about that. So that's where I was getting because it was popular because this is, I guess, around eighty. Rap started hitting, and yeah. there were a bunch of rappers who, like, at parties, they would rap over that track. Oh, really? And, wow. Yeah, and there was actually, I remember there was a group called get this jekyll and hyde yeah they did a song called getting money their whole thing was they were dressed in suits and projected sisters but they had a minor hit with this song and it was obviously using the star child um backing track yeah uh, and one of the guys in that group was andre harrell he was one of the two rappers who started a big record company became ceo of motown for a few years but anyway that was a big thing for us. Like all of my friends, that's the song that they knew, you know, growing up. If I say I'm a fan of level 42, if they don't know, I play that song like, oh, my God, I remember that when we were kids. So that's my question was, well, when did you guys become aware of that? Obviously, it wasn't at the time. Uh, no, it, no, yeah. no. We had no way of knowing. I mean, I think I, the first time I had an inkling that it was a kind of club hit in the New York area yeah. was... Um, I think there was a a club remix compilation, and I think it was the DJ Francois K. Oh yeah, uh, Francois Kervor featured yep. it, featured it on his album, and I was kind of oh, I had no idea. And then it's like more recently, uh, it was Louis Vega who yes. talked about how much how big Star Child was and how much he loved it, and you know he was interviewed on Giles Peterson talking about it. Um, and, and and it's it's only really in recent years, um, as well as you know, uh, I forget who they are now, but there was there was another band, uh, uh, a duo, uh, an American duo, where one of the guys died recently, and the other guy did a tribute to them, and he featured the middle section of Star Child and created a song on top of it. Oh, you know, I'm familiar with that. Yes. Yeah, I can't I can't remember it's an unusual name but the, it's it's like the picture's only kind of emerging now as to what happened with star child back in the beginning of the 80s we just didn't we didn't have a clue about that we had no idea yeah, it's like right, nobody told us as it were <laughs> right so for us you know all my friends like oh my gosh this, this is the track we had no idea the band wasn't we listened to it oh this is some group maybe they're from ohio whatever it's just a funky mm -hmm. band it wasn't in, for me until I got, because I, I, I had the official release. I never, yeah. ever played the flip side. A year later, I joined the military. I flipped the record over. I hear, turn it on. I'm like, mm. oops, I'm loving this. Got to find the album. Um, so that was, that's the thing that pressed me into be, being a fan, like looking for everything that I could find. It's a track that we always start off with in, in any sound check or line check. Um, if we're in a festival situation where we get a sound check and we've only got one track to do, it'll always be Star Child. 
Um, it's always pretty much always in the set, um, in that sort of position of as the kind of the bookend of whatever other stuff we might have been doing that that might have, we might not have played for a while. Um, in and and the start of the kind of the run into the sort of the greatest hits medley of something about you and lessons in love and so on. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of know exactly where we are with it. Um, it's always fun to play. And I kind of get a feeling that a lot of people, when we play it, don't know the track. Um, mm. You know, that that I can sort of see the look on people's faces of like, well, this sounds as though it's kind of one of their hits, but I haven't heard it before kind of thing. Mm. Um, and obviously some people have, and, and, and obviously some people know backwards and inside out that I've been to many gigs. But it's... It's funny because when it was it was released as a single, I believe, and it didn't really do anything at right. the time. And um, so I guess we are probably all collectively thought, well, you know, some seeds fall on stony ground and, you know, let's let's move on. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's lovely to do. Um, it's great because, you know, obviously it's the lead vocal for me and um um yeah and and to hear all that stuff about what happened you know in in new york and and the love that it had you know as as a as a you know studio recording or a, a 12 inch uh is 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 really amazing and it, it just goes to show that you you can't you know you can't write something off um saying you know of its time well maybe you know, this isn't the greatest track they've ever done. I mean, I don't think anyone wrote that, but mm. it's kind of like it's it's had this life, um, you know, that that just keeps on giving, and uh, there's something magic about it. Uh, now, I'm just looking. All right, so it's yeah. So it was. I'm looking at an article from the LA Times. It says a hip hop send off like no other. Yeah. How there's one turns tragedy into an extraordinary album. I remember um, sending this story to you, Mike, when it came out. Ah, up. well, there you go. There you yeah. go. So that was that was it. Because I remember the, I think we did that, you know, there was a request from our publishers about permission to use the, oh, you know, okay. the sample and credit. Because, of course, in the early days, people just sampled without thinking about it. But then, you know, more recent years, then the, they've had to be cleared. And, you know, the, the split has had to be agreed, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, yeah, so, I mean, Star Child, it, it kind of, it's almost like it's grown and grown over the years, and it even sometimes has its own special light show moment, you know, with the mirror ball in the, you know, <laughs> we have time section. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a track that's very dear to our hearts. And, of course, it was Wally Badaru that came up with the thing in the first place as an instrumental on a cassette. I remember he played it to us in that first studio at Hillside when we were doing the early tapes saying yeah, i have this track and uh and and we loved it and we thought well you know maybe we could make it into a level 42 song so uh but you know wally came up with all the keyboard parts all those magical keyboard parts you hear um you know apart from the course the solo in the middle which phil um actually composed and constructed and got me to play the piano while he played glockenspiel on wow so it wasn't Phil who played the solo. He just kind of composed it, right? No, no, he played it. He played no it. No kidding. He came up with it. We, we, we basically got got together in the studio. I think it was at Rack we were, um, mm -hmm. in, in London, and he sort of came up with the with the with the lines and the construction, and then he said he had this sort of shiny sound to go with the track, and so you know, we rented in a Glockenspiel and basically, right. you know, I, I don't know if we re recorded it together um or we did it one at a time but anyway but we sort of did it in 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 one session as it were that that mm. solo but that was that's phil's composition that ding 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 yeah. ding did it ding he wrote that <laughs> go ahead Will. winston are you there he might be on mute please hold <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's gonna be the return of the handsome, rugged. handsome rugged Winston. <laughs> he already he already thinks that song's about him, and it's not. <laughs> uh, did, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. It's yeah, the you return of the handsome rugged man. 
Well, yeah, I have just a, a follow-up <laughs> comment about Star Child before Handsome Rook, if that's okay. Yeah, um, go ahead. Right. Well, it made me think that I wonder if that was a track, because it's happened a lot in New York on the club scene that DJs latched on to it and played, and maybe Polydor decided to release that single here. I, I have no idea, but you know, it just I just suddenly thought about that if maybe uh, yeah no I it. mean I think uh, as far as I know it was always the plan that it was you know that that it was going to be a single I don't think there was any kind of reaction to it happening elsewhere and then oh Polydor suddenly deciding um, because you know the first the the first single was turn it on. I'm uh, sorry, I'm well, I mean, obviously Love Games was the first single off that album, but that was recorded yeah. before we went into the studio to record the rest of the album. So that was kind of a, a lead single recorded, you know, up front, as it were. And then we went to do the rest of the Level 42 album. And then Turn It On became the next single. And I think Star Child was, you know, effectively Turn It On was the first single to promote the, the then Level 42 album. And then I think Star Child was, was always intended to be the kind of follow-up, as it were. And there was some jiggery poker in trying to cut it down because we always tended to write these songs that were too damn long for the, uh, the radio pluggers. You know, radio. they wanted their three minutes, 40 seconds. And right. many of Level 42 songs and singles do not fit into three minutes, 40 seconds. So we'd like, you know, <laughs> we'd drop it to just over four minutes and call it three minutes, you know, 59.5 or something. <laughs> <laughs> that, that whole trip. All right, so now my guilty pleasure question. Um, handsome Return of the Handsome Rugged Man is my favorite song of all time by the band. Uh, do you have any recollections of recording that? Um, I remember that we were, it was one of the songs that we was, was pretty much complete in terms of its arrangement in that we'd, we'd sort of jammed it around for a, you know, a, a few months before we went in the studio and there was a requirement to have a B-side and we we tended in those days to sort of record B-sides as, as new tracks, as it were. It gave a chance to out the kind of instrumental side of uh, things, you know, things like Beza One and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, we always felt it was, it was an honourable thing to sort of not just have a a remix of the A side on the B side, but actually to have a B side, um, which was a different track entirely. And so we pretty much laid it down as we'd uh, rehearsed it. And then Wally came into the studio because he was he was he was he wasn't part of the rehearsing. He'd always come in when we were actually doing the recording sessions. And he came in and he added, you know, extra kind of synth sounds to sort of build up the parts um, that I'd kind of laid down on on roads. But, I mean, it was recorded with the four of us in the room, you know, Rhodes, you know, bass, drums and guitar. So it was a kind of, that's, that's how we recorded, you know, a lot of stuff was, was the four of us in the room. Even if it meant that the, the, the keys and the guitar were not final and sometimes even the bass. But, but the idea was to get as much of the drums and the, and the bass down. And, uh, and I think we sort of, I think my Rhodes was from that original you know, take, whatever it was. I don't know what take it was, but it, I don't think we did very many, if, if at all. And, um, and yeah, and then Boone overdubbed the guitar solo, and I think he came up with the title, Return of the Handsome Rugged Man, I think. Uh, I don't know whether he'd seen okay. it somewhere or... Um, I think it was an advert of some sort. Yeah, I think I think it was a copy line from an advert that that was was borrowed. <laughs> yeah, I think I read somewhere that it was a, a a title of a story in a magazine or something. Oh, maybe it yeah. was. But you know, but that could just it was be something, you know, something, fan yeah, something, legends. Something like that. Something like that. I don't know who it was about or any. I don't remember any of the details of the origin of that. But yeah, you won't get in trouble for it. Uh, you know, I just love on that song, like the the drums, how they cut through. You know, Mark's bass is very low, and and Phil's drums has got a reverb. It, it it's just it it might be the tightest snare I, I've heard him use, almost Stuart Copeland like. Uh, yeah, I, I just love that the drumming in that track. Yeah, I mean, Phil plays a blinder on it. He's really kind of. 
has gone full sort of Cobham slash Lenny White on that track. You know, it's very, it's very kind of Return to Forever inspired, that sort of rundown section and the rising chords and things. And, uh, um, you know, Mark came up with that, that, that top line um, that goes above the bass. And, uh, and I filled it out with the chords that I thought would sort of, you know, take it out, out to outer space kind of thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we haven't really played that live um, much, if at all, since. I know. Um, so it's uh, it might be one for a, you know, a return. As it were. In, in oh, don't tease I, me, sir. Don't tease me. <laughs> I was wondering on that song, Mike, when you're trading off Mark, he's playing his bass lick, you're following on the keyboard. Did that take, mm. like, hours of practice? uh not really i mean there were hours spent in re in like say in this rehearsal studio just going over and bashing through ideas and i think probably our kind of musical relationship was was a lot forged in those things because mm -hmm. you know you you try the same thing the next day or you know after after the sandwich break and you try something different or someone would say you know what's that chord or try i'm hearing this and you know i try and hear it what they were hearing or, you know, oh, I don't like that or whatever. Um, so, you know, it, I suppose it's, it, it's become um, almost like a, a, the, the relationship I have. It's almost like I know what to play when, when he plays bass and he mm. kind of knows what to play. But that's just developed, that relationship, is, that chemistry has just developed over the years just from playing and playing together and just knowing each other kind of, inside out and probably you know knowing each other's personalities as well because i realized there's, there's a whole other aspect to this it's not just musical you know musical kind of sentences and words and phrases that we're trading but it's it's something more than that that is is about you know knowing the person and kind of knowing what the person digs and what they don't dig and then throwing a few curveballs in there occasionally and that sort of thing <laughs> That's it's a classic, cool. it's a cl classic uh, go between between you guys and it. Um, I'd like to ask my geek out questions if the gentlemen don't mind. Um, no, go for it. All right. So one win, you kind of took it, uh, which I was going to ask what single should have done better in the charts, which Mike already answered. But Mike, is there an album cut that you felt should have been a single and wasn't? Um. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, there are probably a couple. Um, I mean, nothing's going to the tip of my tongue, but I do know that there were certain songs. I mean, there were certain songs that I really liked, and uh, I thought well, it's a shame that it didn't get a chance to be a single. Mm -hmm. um, silence. I, I, funnily enough, I was about to say silence. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that that could have been, you know, could have could have, maybe woulda. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, what else? Uh, let's see. I mean, actually, another B side that's probably one, of, uh, probably my favourite B side, or one of my favourite B sides, is um, at this great distance. Oh yeah, um, oh, yeah that's which great. it is probably not single material at all, but I think it's I think it's a wonderful composition on George Green's words because he he would fax, you know he's a natural writer and a lyricist and he faxed those words over to Mark, mm -hmm. and then you know to Mark's studio and and that was how kind of Lasso the Moon came from that you know I took those words and turned that into that song and. You know, at this great distance, you know, Mark read it and he kind of heard this kind of space thing. And it was one of the things where it came together really quickly. And I just really like the fact that it's untypical, if you like, of the sort of thing that we did um, with the talking of it. And, and I really like it musically. Um, what other tracks, you know, do I think could have been singles that weren't? Um, I, that's something I'd have to ponder on. And I'd probably, yeah. as soon as I put the phone down, I'd probably think <laughs> it's about two or three or, you know, tomorrow when I'm driving into Glasgow to get my car serviced through the frost, I'm sure that will <laughs> maybe think, inspire something. 
It's okay. <laughs> um, one more quick one and one more, just a little bit more grandiose. In the entire Level 42 canon, what is the song that was the most challenging for you to play live? I have uh, a prediction on written on a piece of paper. If I get it right, I'm going to show it to you. If I get it wrong, I'll just tell you. <laughs> Um, well, hmm. my choice is weird. It's a, it's an oddball. Yeah. Uh, what's well, not easy to play live? Um, funnily enough, well, one of them is something about you. That's hmm. actually, I find that not so easy. Um, it doesn't. It kind of just doesn't flow naturally as it way. I mean, we've been playing it for years, so we know how to play it. Um, but it's it, it's one that's that requires kind of effort and concentration to really sort of pull it off well. Whereas, um, you know, Lessons in Love or Star Child, for example, they seem to just really flow fairly easily. So I, I don't know why. Um, mm. Um, it's just one of those things. Now there are there are a couple of other songs which uh, have been really tricky to play, but I can't can't think of any when you put me on the spot. I was going um, like back a bit, and we we talked about the song earlier. Follow me was the one I had picked, and I just there's different counter rhythms going on in that song. I feel like there's three different keyboard ports, and you got to sing back up at the same time. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, um, it had the benefit of um, a bit of uh, cheating, let's say, um, in that it was recorded live and then we added a, f uh, a couple of overdubs when we were mixing the live album. So it's a sort of mainly live, but with a bit of studio thrown in there. So to reproduce it as you hear it on the record would be probably have been tricky back in the day but now with the kind of aid of you know computers and logic and stuff it probably wouldn't be a problem but we haven't really played it since then so that wouldn't come up on my list because it's not something that we've revisited mm. Mm -hmm. i think wow. you did i thought you did revisit it like uh maybe you were out of the band at that point like uh, uh like in the early 2000s perhaps well i wasn't in the band you know i, I yeah. was out of the band yeah, between 94 when we kind of stopped and then Mark restarted it in kind of 99 and right. I didn't rejoin till 2006. So, yep. yes, it's possible that it was done in my absence. Yeah. All right. Uh, one last I, uh, one. Go ahead. Oh, no, go, please, Bob. Go right ahead. No, go ahead, Mike. Uh, two quick questions, Mike, and these are the last ones for me. And, and, and I just wanted to say thank you for being you. Uh, I don't. I don't want money or a kidney. So these compliments are genuine. Uh, thank you for your music. Thank you for spreading messages that uh, I wish people could articulate their arguments like you, the way that you're able to do it lyrically and musically. Uh, the two quick questions I have is is a two parter. When was the moment you realized when you started out with Level Forty Two back in 1980? When was it that you felt that there was something that this was going to lead to something bigger than you had imagined? Um, hmm. Well, you know, the, 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 the rise of, of the success of the band, you know, in, in all senses was, was gradual and progressive you know it wasn't like we became you know huge overnight which mm -hmm. i think is definitely was a good thing because by the time you know we were getting limos and private planes and invited to clubs and stuff like that it was you know about five or six years in and we kind of had a sense of how things worked so in in the main i think we didn't sort of let it go too much to our heads because, you know, it wasn't like we'd suddenly become really important people on the planet. It was because we were selling a lot of records. Um, and that 
that selling of a lot of records was built on lots and lots of touring on our part and honing our craft. You know, we effectively had an apprenticeship because Polydor gave us a five-year contract in 1981, which was amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's so changed since then. But that mm-hmm. gave us five albums over five years to sort of learn how to write songs and how to record and how to use studio time well and all of that. I see. Um, but then, you know, I mean, obviously uh, when, you know, when Lessons in Love got to number one in seven countries in the world, I think that was probably a, one of the seminal moments of, of Blimey, you know, this is, this is really, this is really big. Um, and, you know, s- stepping on stage at, you know, in Hammersmith to 215 nights or stepping on stage at Soldier Field, um, you know, to open for Madonna and, you know, thousands of people coming in or or doing, you know, headlining at Glastonbury in 1986, yeah. you know, with 50,000 yeah. people there. You know, that those those are kind of moments that you kind of think, wow, this is, you know, this is something else. It's, it's amazing you said that, you know, you've been able to play some of the world's most amazing venues and concert halls and that for you uh, must be quite a a fun experience visiting all these halls um you know you you know we're all you know well the ones on this podcast are you know kind of came of age professionally in the in the 80s um mike but you're also you're part of the 80s in a very unique way being in a band that that forged what the 80s were um, for those of us who don't understand what it's like to be in that kind of position, what, what's it like to be Mike Lindup, to be visible, to be, to know when you walk outside, people are maybe staring at you kind of saying, I know who he is. Um, I, I can't imagine what that's like. That's a great you question. Mean, you, mean, you mean then or now? Or, either or, either or. Yeah, that's the, different. The, you know, I mean when when the band was kind of really high in the charts you sort of you know 86 87 88 89 um you know that then i kind of you know experienced you know some of the the benefits and saw some of the pitfalls of of kind of being a famous person as it were Mm -hmm. um um, and, and also but earlier having open for really famous people. Like I can remember when we got off this first big break to open for the police in Germany in 1981, and they just released Ghost in the Machine. They were like oh, yeah. riding high, and yep. and we were this kind of unknown band opening for them. And I remember we were playing in Freiburg in Germany, and I remember going out for a kind of morning walk just to sort of look around and see a bit of the place. And... Uh, and I suddenly saw Sting having a walk around and he had he had one of those sheepskin jackets on with the collars fully up and he had a flat cap on and he could just about see his eyes and his nose. And I kind of he clocked me and I clocked him and um, and I kind of obviously followed, you know, his and the police's career since yeah. then, because, the, you know, that that was a thing that really made our live show was doing those opening shows for them. Um, it really got us together. But um, I, I remember seeing, you know, how famous he became and the fact that, you know, when you're like that, you can't go anywhere and you can't say anything without it being reported and you, you can't just get on the bus or get on the tube or go to the shops, you know, without, you know, a lot of attention. So I kind of saw, hmm, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's, there's sides to that. And I feel that I've been quite lucky in that, the most famous thing about Level 42 is Level 42 and the music of Level 42. And then after that is, is Mark as being the most recognised person. Um, I've tended to sort of get away with it. I mean, obviously, if we're together or if we're at the concert hall, that's one thing. But if I'm like travelling around, you know, I would get recognised occasionally or, you know, don't I know you? Or, or you know, sometimes mistaken for a famous footballer or rugby player or something like that, which was kind of funny. <laughs> I remember signing, um, you know, that rugby player's autograph once in a service station. <laughs> which is not a very clever thing to do, but I was just feeling mischievous. Oh, wow. You know. Um, 
but yeah uh it's it's kind of you know and now it's kind of like there's the advent of social media and and kind of having a platform in that sense it's like there is a kind of responsibility to you know to kind of present yourself well and to um and particularly not try and join in all of the 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 muck slinging that is very easy to do you know mm. um i i actually saw a great quote it was probably on facebook um from some uh it, i think he was a writer or a philosopher and he said you know in olden times people had convictions nowadays people have opinions mm -hmm. you don't build the cathedral with opinions <laughs> absolutely absolutely and that was you know that really kind of stayed with me because you know knowing how you know some of these cathedrals took 650 years to build and you you think about that phrase and uh it really it really struck me and and sort of the the opposite side to that is is kind of like uh and it's something that i've been thinking lately a lot with all the conflicts going on is that we we obviously cannot solve uh, age-old problems using age-old techniques you know they obviously have been tried and they just don't work so you know revenge just leads to more revenge etc etc mm -hmm. so we kind of need new approaches to resolving issues and bloody hell i mean we're in the 21st century and like i said in courage for change you know when i was young the future was a beautiful place and one of the things i thought mm -hmm. you know that we get to the 21st century and we be more like Star Trek, where we could, you know, we could have discussions to resolve our differences and come to exactly rather exactly. than you know breaking out all the old weaponry and and you know stirring up all the old kind of hatreds and you know giving historical justifications for why you know mm. this war needs to continue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it's like you pointed out in Atlantia. Uh, you know, we, we have so much more we're alike than than then we're not um and when we we did an episode of our podcast reviewing your album mike which i hope you get to hear soon and and yeah, i and i, I talked and i talked about the very last track uh, courage to change um because that was the last track on the album and i put it on pause before i heard it because i was like this is the last new song i'm gonna hear i'm gonna wait a few minutes and i played that track and what struck me about it was kind of you telling us, okay, if you haven't heard any message I've done, any song I've done, I want you to listen to this track and I want you to listen to this message. It's it's kind of the vibe I got from Courage to Change um, with its very Xenadu-esque ending that I freaking love. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 caught, I, I caught heck for terming it that way in the podcast, but um, I... I it, what a perfect track to end your masterpiece with, Mike, honestly. Well, mm -mm -mm. you know, it, it's, it's wonderful you saying that. And, and it also underlines something else, which, um, you know, I have to take my hat off to Adele for sticking up for, which is running order. Running order is really important. Um, you know, if you like an album, you want to hear the album in album running order. And artists do take a lot of time. I know this. Choosing what's going to start the album, what's going to be after what, and what's going to end the album. And once Carriage to Change had, was really coming together with the kind of lyrics and the idea, I thought this this has got to be a final statement. This has got to be the ending. So I'm very grateful that, that um, you know, Spotify did kind of listen to Adele and other artists saying, look, can you make the default that when you press play in the album, it plays it in the album running order yeah. as is as desired by the artist and it doesn't just go automatically into shuffle play which just you know it's yeah it's i think it's kind think of that's annoying them it's, selling it it's annoying it's annoying and, and i mean you know there, there are obviously people who kind of like well it doesn't matter it's it's, this, it's the same album just hearing it a different way around and um but you know to to to, to us it's important so you know it's like it, courage to change really had to be the ending on 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 changes too, and 
I would have stuck my neck out if if my producers had objected and saying no, it needs to be something else. Uh, I would have said no, it's got to be courage to change. So, I think you would have had your fan base one hundred percent behind you on that, Mike. <laughs> yeah, really. Who's the boss here, right? Right. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's <laughs> kind of like I said. It was I gave them permission to lead me with with yeah. the with the production and some of the decisions on it because I wanted to. You know, because if I'd have made the album without them, it would be a very different album, and I would dare say it would be a poorer album because, mm. you know, it, it, you know, the, some of the songs might be similar, but the production would be different, and you know, and and the production is important because it's it's the conveyor, you know, of the song, and uh, you know, I, I'm I'm really happy, I'm really happy with the relationship that we've got. I'm looking forward to doing new new stuff working with those guys. So, anyway, watch yeah. this space. And they let you um, do all as one, the full version of it, right? I mean, it's a long song. They weren't, probably wanted to cut it shorter. Yeah, well, actually, uh, it was cut a bit because the original was about really? 17 minutes. No. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, almost. And, uh, yeah, so we did do a bit of editing to it. And they, you know, they, they did, they were commenting on how long it was. Um, but uh once we got into you know and that's listening to the demo but once we got into sort of you know overdubs and mike did some, did some beautiful pad overdubbing on on my sort of parts and enhancements and so on and uh when the roads went on and so on it, it just had a vibe to it and um we all kind of agreed that it was it was nice having that vibe i mean it was long but it was nice and i've since read uh that um it, when you're writing music that wants to sort of um, put people into a kind of an altered state, um, then y you need at least 10 minutes to get to that. And so, because I think it's 11 something long, I think, yeah, that's good because it's kind of, it draws you in and it's, it's got time to be that. And uh, yeah, so. Thank I was think I was saying on a, another, podcast Mike, that we uh, when we talked about c2 um the end of that song kind of that long draw out of it reminds me a little bit of the second part in super uh superwoman by stevie wonder some of the oh. instrumentation reminds me of that well, that's interesting well <laughs> you know i mean stevie's definitely in my dna um, mm -hmm. so uh you know certainly unconsciously and um you know he is my kind of desert island artist and uh, i i've been lucky enough to be i've been in the same room as him three times and i've been stupid enough to not gone up and said hello all three times mm -hmm. so, which i really regret maybe you can pull a string somewhere and say hey uh someone can i just get five minutes with this guy <laughs> just say how well, much he I meant mean, to me? I, i'd have to come to america for a starters We'll make that happen. <laughs> Tell up to Winston. We would love to have you in America. The Nam show. He's always there. There you go. Hmm. <laughs> it's yes. coming up in about a month, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Well, in fact, um, I might be coming to Nam um, not this year necessarily, but next year because um, I'm going to be getting hold of one of the new Rhodes pianos um, uh, at some point, hopefully not too long in the future, because there's a long waiting list. And they, uh, I asked them about NAM because they have been, but they said they weren't going this year. I mean, it's, it's a big, it's a big deal going to NAM, you know, yeah. especially if you're a non U US based company, there's a lot of, um, you know, expense involved in doing it, and it has to, you know, be justified, as it were. And so they're they're planning apparently to go in 2025. So I did actually look because I'm somehow got on the NAM mailing list. I did look to going this year, but the thing is, it's it's a long way to go, and I could I I have to really justify any expenses on you know any outgoings on on a trip like that you know what would right. what would what would i get out of it you know mm. would it be worth doing as it were you know i'm obviously be, be nice to go and, and all of that 
but it has to be more than that you know it has to be something promotional for the album or or you know something specific that that i think i'm going for you know i've also been invited to the ground up festival um in miami which is uh the beginning of february um which is you know snarky puppies um kind of festival um because some good friends of mine here in the uk they go every year and they keep saying mike you must go it's great you must go and there's the hang from the jams and the blah 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 and you know similarly i would love to go um but i i have to think well you know i have to really i don't really know how to say this but you know i haven't just got loads of money lying around for me to do anything i feel like it, it sure. has, there has to be there has to be a, a reason to go um that would really make it worthwhile going so um yeah. but um, i feel that america is calling me with this album and uh, <laughs> i need to go i knew i do need to go and uh i will find a way yeah we're gonna well, help you mike I've been re reading a lot of Yolanda Charles posts recently about artists taking control of their music, and I'm all in favor of that. Now it's now it's disseminated, um, uh, and and I also think we're hopefully going back to a Renaissance style where your patrons, where the patrons used to really you know financially support their artists to be able to fulfill their visions and things. And I, you know, your Bandcamp page is a really good example of that, um, but. Uh, I, I, I think that's uh, an area, hopefully, where we're going. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, and it's something that I need to really work on too, it, to cultivate that because, you know, I wasn't trained to do that. You know, I didn't have lessons about how to be a, an independent artist when I was at school and, you know, how to promote yourself on social media is, is, a, is a whole new thing. Um, and it doesn't, you know, necessarily come naturally to everybody, and it certainly doesn't come naturally to me. Um, I'm learning how to do it as I go, and uh, um, you know, it's something that I could do more of in in terms of. I mean, what's great about direct fan engagement is just that is that there's no middleman, and you can you can talk directly and say, look, this is coming out, and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can res you can read the comments, you can respond to comments. I mean, that's something that just wasn't there back in the day. You know, it was all filtered via the, the, the press department or, you know, just bumping into people at concerts. But apart from that, you know, there was there was no, you know, unless somebody wrote to the fan club and then the letter might be passed on and all of that sort yeah. of thing. So, um, and it's really served me well with changes to, uh, you know, going, going directly to the fans, as it were, um, and having my own label. And I, I, I like a lot of it, and I like, I like the, the independence, and I like, you know, the ownership of that. But, um, you know, with it comes the sort of challenges of, of you know, I want to reach people, you know. I mean, the people such as yourselves are amazing, and, you know, and I bless you. But I also want to reach people that have never heard of me or Level 42. And how right. do I do that? Yep. It's a challenge, right, to um, <clears throat> break through in a, in a world with, uh, you know, so much competing for attention spans. And But the cream always rises. You know, this is a great album. And we're not just saying it. We believe this is just an incredible piece of work, Mike. Well, thank um, you. Yeah. And uh, for those... Uh, who can't get enough Mike Linda? Really, you should go check out and subscribe to his Bandcamp page. Uh, one of the cool things you put on there, Mike, was the uh, how to play uh, "Living It Up." Mm. Uh, all three of us have butchered that for years, ah. yeah. and we're still butchering it. But it's still it's much better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not butchering it at all. I press play on the record player; <laughs> it plays just fine. All right. Um, well, listen, Mike, we've kept you a long time. I know I, I, we speak for so many fans who want to thank you for helping to fulfill the soundtracks of our lives, uh, for continuing to put out such great music, and for really being a nice guy who does a lot of good in the world. Michael David, Linda, thank you so much for being on Turn It On. Please come back anytime. Thank you, Bob. Thank, thank you, Mike. Mike. Thank you, Winston. Very thank welcome. you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Much. Been a pleasure. Been a all right, and we want to thank everybody who tuned in. Uh, for Winston Walker, Mikey, the color of my pain, I'm Bob Considine. 
We're leaving you now, but we will wait to return. See you next time.